Lee, for anybody who doesn't recognize you or know you, um, how would you introduce yourself to the oh, world? Oh, you want my elevator speech? Yeah, then. give me your elevator pitch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so a naturopathic physician is a licensed medical provider in Oregon. And basically where we can provide holistic primary care. Um, we're trained in like we have a four year medical school we go to have clinical training and residency programs thereafter. Um, but, you know, we have a pretty broad range of tools we use outside of just pharmaceuticals and uh, referrals for surgery or stuff like that. We have like we work with nutrition, we work with lifestyle, we work with diet. We have some other natural therapies too we like to use. So sometimes people think of, oh, my supplements or botanical medicines. Um, the things I like using are a lot of diet or nutrition, lifestyle, um, fasting. So things that our body naturally do. But our biggest thing is that we believe that the body has an innate ability to heal itself. And so we like to use those tools that the body has. Awesome. Uh, I have to change one thing. Oh, sure. I'll be right back. Uh, are you gonna hoard that water over there or can uh, i have can i have one of yeah, them yeah you can take it oh okay go ahead i wasn't sure if you wanted both of them <laughs> no, 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 it's all awesome. but yeah I, I think the biggest thing i like to tell people you know everyone knows like they get a cut and then they don't really have to do anything for a cut right mm -hmm. they like maybe you want to clean it like you've been told and like bandage it to make sure it doesn't no debris or anything gets in it but you just kind of are creating a safe space for it to heal itself. And that's what a lot of naturopathic medicine is, is you want to remove these obstacles that are being presented to a injured area so they can heal naturally and then your body's going to heal it up. Then there's like kind of post care that you can do to help maybe heal, to help like the scar tissue. So there's kind of these maintenance things around it. But if you extrapolate that to other things, that's kind of the, the gist of what we, tr we try to do. We try to use the body's physiology to stimulate healing responses. Awesome. So yeah. uh, before we get, I think like too into um, a lot of the practices, oh, the procedures sure. that you yeah. advocate, um, just really kind of like speaking from like a high level, like you're a practicing naturopathic physician here yeah. in Portland, Oregon. And, um, how we met was actually through the rock climbing gym where you also, uh, happened to set, uh, some of the problems. So mm -hmm. you established the routes that people climb on. And, um, I really, I'm really curious to, um, and so maybe we can kind of get into that after I kind of ask maybe this question, but, um, like I wanted to know how you became a naturopathic physician, but before yeah. we maybe get into that story for people who are unfamiliar with, um, naturopathic medicine and how it compares to, I think like the most common, um, like modality that people have heard of that maybe, uh, kind of has some crossover is like osteopathy. Mm. Um, uh, could you explain where, um, like a naturopathic physician versus an osteopath versus, um, like a traditional, is Me it medical just like doctor. medical doctor mm -hmm. in, in the hospital? Like how those, um, yeah, how those disciplines oh, are sure. different. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, I always like looking at history when I look at these things. So if we look at like the early 1900s, and so this is, I actually spent some time looking at this because I was like, wow, what's going on with my, my profession and what's going on with the DOs, doctors mm -hmm. of osteopathy, and then what's going on with medical doctors? Um, so there's the American Medical Association, which DOs and MDs are regulated by, or it's their kind of organizing body. But DOs were actually not part of the AMA uh, for a bit. And AMA then is- uh, The American Medical Association. Okay. Um, and then, I think, I don't want to, I think I want to put a time frame out there, but I don't know the exact day, date, but I think it's in the sixties or so. Um, that That's when the DOs started to become part of the AMA. They actually were brought into it. So their body, their organizing body of doctors of osteopathy became more accepted in the medical paradigm. And so now they're part of their whole medical infrastructure. So MD, DO, you might see them, but the DO has been classically in the conventional medicine field viewed as kind of the more alternative approach. And it's probably because they use uh, practices that are similar, similar to chiropractic chiropractors. Mm -hmm. um, so they use like they use osteopathic adjustments to treat people. So they look at basically uh, 
skeletal musculoskeletal system and how it's affecting someone's health and specifically how maybe like changes in someone's skeletal system or making many manipulation or adjustment can improve their health um so that's kind of medical doctors and DOs a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, NDs are kind of, you know, are, we're a separate organ, are a separate organization. And so basically we have our own regulating body and we're not part of the American Medical Association. We're not part of that infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a large part of that has to deal with um, kind of initial um, what were philosophical beliefs at the time and are more coming like to the rigors of science. But between, if you have you read the book, The Biology Belief by Bruce Lipton? Uh, I don't think I have, but I think uh, my girlfriend Lisa has, and we may even have it on the bookshelf oh, uh, yeah. somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can spot it real quick. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, the one of the big intros in that, that whole book is they talk about scientific materialism a little bit. And, um, but also they talk about, um, uh, atomism and vitalism. So these two philosophical beliefs about how the world functions. So atomism is, you know, uh, the, the the essential molecule of the world is the atom, and then all things derive from that. So very physical view. And then vitalism is that there's actually an energetic component to how the function of life. Mm-hmm. So I think vitalism had a lot to do with like. Um, this belief in a spirit or life force. And so in early on naturopathic medicine, you see you see this. A lot of the naturopaths there were very religious people like Benedict Lust, the founding father in naturopathy and naturopathic medicine and uh, the naturopathic medical schools. Um, he was pretty religious guy. He's like, I think he was an evangelical. Mm-hmm. evangelical. Uh, he's part of the evangelical church. Um, and then he also translated book uh, books by this guy, um, Adolf Joost. Yeah. And this guy, if you read the book, it's like this, his book is called return to nature. Mm-hmm. And it, it almost seems like it's like, Whoa, this perspective that this combining of Bible and, and like this belief of returning to a, uh, our, our, our to nature as in like, uh, almost this Adam Eve esque thing. And so I think there was this religiosity as part of early naturopathic medicine that had to do with a belief system and vitalism and like life, life force and spirit today. I would say a lot of our profession is not like that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we are there, the scientific rigors that we look at have to do a lot with uh, physiological basis for life. So uh, we look at homeostasis a lot. We are kind of examine the physiological role, physiological processes and how they are sustaining life. What is it like uh, uh, for people who aren't familiar with that term, like homeostasis? Uh, oh, like, yeah. It's like the layman like explanation of what that is. Yeah, that's basically um, the body's ability to accommodate stresses. And so it's it's not like a baseline static kind of thing it's our, we're always encountering different things and so we need to respond to it mm-hmm. and so we need to respond to it in a manner that is um basically doesn't lead to our death you know we can we encounter so many things in, our, in the world that could easily lead to our death like toxins etc um and our body is able to cope with those things and able to adjust and to basically find some not equilibrium but like um basically it's a point of of balance so i'd say balance is the big mm-hmm. big thing in there that word you can think of homeostasis and balance as two things yeah with uh with naturopathic medicine like i know one of the things that um or one of the differentiating factors that i've always heard talked about and friends who have like recommended different naturopaths recommended or talked about as well is that like um, in naturopathic medicine there tends to be more and, and please, like, correct me if uh, if I'm misspeaking at any point, but uh, there tends to be a bit more of a holistic, like, overview of a, of a patient mm-hmm. and um, yeah. a lot of factors oriented around, like, how someone is living, whether it's, um, th- like, the toxins in their environment or the foods that they're ingesting, their digestion, like, all of those um, areas will be kind of, like, assessed, whereas sometimes not always in um, a more traditional setting a patient will come in and uh, treatment will be um, a little bit more narrow in terms of like the um, 
analysis as to like what could be wrong and then mm. how to to treat it is is that fair to kind of like say as far as like approach of a naturopath yeah. versus a medical doctor well i mean traditional i think I, it goes back to those philosophical belief systems again so and, and i'm sorry but should we maybe actually put the disclaimer out there like, oh yeah. oh sure <laughs> oh yeah let me read it I, yeah. I found it i was like let's just read it verbatim so essentially like lee lee is a, a licensed <laughs> naturopathic physician but we wanted to to yeah. share uh, so any uh information in yeah. this podcast uh, <laughs> you should always consult a physician before beginning a treatment i think uh i think that's a good advice yeah <laughs> awesome yeah so if you have uh, any life-threatening um disease or injury yeah. like please consult like your local medical yeah. practitioner and yeah so we will be talking about uh some more specific disease related things and possible treatments that people use, I guess, for that and uh, upcoming treatments too that are being studied. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but I'm to glad that we put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think I wrote it down too. Yeah. Um, a big thing uh, I think it relates back to is those kind of differences in approach to science. Mm -hmm. So um, with the atom, right, you're examining very small thing, you know, you're basically, it's reductionism. It's you're, you're going to kind of figure out the, the single cause, cause of something. Mm -hmm. um, so unilateral, unilateral causality, you know, it's only, there's usually one thing that's related to. And around in, in this, in this, Bruce Lipton talks about this in the biology of belief, is the central dogma of biology. And that is a one-way track genes leading to, higher, to, to what we see, a life form, you know? So genes are the biggest regulatory thing. They're mm -hmm. the thing that's gonna explain behavior, explain body function, um, et cetera. And, and that actually, it's a dogma, right? That's, it's part of that title, Central Dogma Biology. It's mm -hmm. not true, really. It's, uh, it was too dogmatic. And so the, the approach in that science is, you know, we grew up kind of thinking, um, uh, nature versus nurture, right? Your genes versus your, your environment. And um, environment is showing to be a bigger player than we think it is. And so this goes then a little bit into the philosophical belief in uh, vitalism. You know, it, I think that their approach was looking at things and how they relate to each other more so than, uh, than looking at specifically at um, a, a, some problem in a body in someone's body. And or this is all in the process. in the foundational text that you mentioned earlier. That that's like from naturopathic medicine, or yeah. I mean, I, I'm kind of, this is kind of like um, I mean, as far as foundation for naturopathic medicine, uh, we definitely have our our principles that we mm -hmm. we abide by, and then our the therapeutic order that we utilize. Mm -hmm. um, those would be pretty good things to talk about too. Um, but uh, I think uh, belief systems be before that are the thing that de really define us mm -hmm. and kind of lead us so to, these to are the how we systems. treat yeah. people differently now. And then belief systems also into uh, scientific approach. So scientific reductionism versus using uh, a different sort of science, maybe like Gertian science, where you're kind of engaging the subjective and the objective into. So the, me as the, the, the observer, Mm -hmm. And that is always going to have some sort of bias and input. And so just being aware of that also, but also noticing that how my own uh, judgment can play a part into these, these factors too. Mm -hmm. But sorry, that's a little tangent. The, I think to, the, the biggest thing we, the old naturopaths used to call it is terrain. So we like mm -hmm. to look at the terrain. What are, what are the things in the person's body or their environment or what are the, thing, the things that are not optimal that are leading to disease? So you think in the 1900s, you know, like this is, industrial boom right so what we, we see is, is like that when naturopathic medicine was kind of started in the early 1900s yeah it comes from i say later 1800s where you have the water cure movement in uh in germany mm -hmm. and one of the big proponents is that is priestnitz and this guy basically is like he he got injured i think like a wagon fell on him or something and then uh he was like I, I don't know if he broke a bone or he was injured. And then he, through his own examination of how animals heal, he saw basically a wounded deer um, rest in some water and after it was injured. And so he like kind of took that to another level and seeing, and was trying to see if he, how, if he could heal himself through water. And so this is called water cure, but also hydrotherapy. And so it comes from out of this movement that these simple so modes that like colonics and uh, no, like this that. is just like using like hot, cold treatments, oh. like, uh, and then varying them. And then basically it's stimulating your body to like, uh, 
create fevers or to warm itself up or, or to increase blood flow in the area. Yeah, that's really um, very popular now with a lot of the cryotherapy yeah, yeah. that uh they, 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 could probably could, they probably could trace their roots back to precedence then, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and uh, like Laird Hamilton, the professional surfer who also runs like a, a training modality called the XPT, I think, which experience, I don't know yeah. that what the acronym stands for, but they're big on uh, hot cold. So going from a sauna that's 200 degrees yeah. to ice baths. But again, like the same idea around um, contrast. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like hot and cold. Yeah, and it's like using these simple therapies like that are available to us, like water, sun. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the things that, like in the 1900s, you know, or that time you see industrial boom, bigger cities, uh, more infections because higher density of people, uh, pollution. So people moving like, from farming into yeah. living in apartments close to the factory. And then maybe not having great uh, sewage systems. Mm-hmm. So hygiene was a big issue. Um and then uh, pollutants from factories, uh, people not going out, being out as much. Mm-hmm. So you, they see a, a rise in like um, hay fever, which is basically seasonal allergies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe some more, a rise of the other chronic diseases. So people have removed from traditional diets too that may be associated with mm-hmm. their, the farming lifestyle. Um, so then there had the, came up these simple therapies. One of them was like the, that water cure part, water cure movement. Um, but then like the hygienic movement, have you ever heard of that? No, I'm not familiar. You know, like, have you seen, you know, Kellogg's cereal? Uh, Kellogg's. Yeah, Kellogg's. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I you, remember reading Yeah, there's about... a guy named Dr. Kellogg, actually. Uh-huh. And he has like this whole text about hygiene. So, like, and how, what are the ways we can live in a clean lifestyle? So, it, a lot of the times he talks about eating eating clean mm-hmm. uh eating having a healthy lifestyle so like physical physical activity diet uh getting sun um those kind those kind of things are kind of part of oh sleep right mm-hmm. sleep hygiene right everyone heard that has heard of that um those kind of things were the part of that hygiene movement and so a combination of all these things and then also um being surrounded in a and basically a medical system that was like hey these are we don't see these as like valid points or valid uses of, uh, of medicine um, or, and so that we're, we're being surrounded by all those things. It's like, they've kind of been in the fringe, I'd say more so like, mm-hmm. like some of the practices get assimilated as the research is done on them um, and proves their validity. But um, yeah, the, the history of naturopathic medicine is like, it's, it's gone through periods of where it's almost died, you know, like I think in the fifties, there's one school left and there's like two people enrolled in it. Mm-hmm. And then um, basically there's been a huge push in some of the the people that have been in naturopathic medicine uh, to become more, you know, to basically provide better education, but also to um, basically advocate for us legislatively. Mm-hmm. Um and so that's why in Oregon, we probably have some of the most, the, the most rights that we see um, in, in the United States. Washington's pretty high up there. And so is Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we just have, there's more acceptance of what we do. If you ask generally, like most people on the street, hey, do you know what a naturopathic doctor is? Uh, they'd probably be like, what, what's that? You know, mm-hmm. or they'd say, is that, oh, you mean a homeopath? Uh, they'd say something like that. So, um, they're like, yeah, well, yeah, uh, those things. But um, most people don't know exactly what we do. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that kind of maybe can lead into what, what your origin story is, because we're here in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And um, you did your naturopathic medicine studies here in mm-hmm. Portland, right? Um, what drew you to naturopathic medicine? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Let's start undergrad. So living in Arizona. Yeah, right? yeah. So my undergrad was I went to the University of Arizona, mm-hmm. uh, got my bachelor's in science and psychology, and I think one of the most the two most pivotal classes there, outside of some of the physiology pro, uh, classes I took, actually three. I took cell physiology was a awesome class that I learned so much uh, about how cells work, and it kind of inspired me to look more at the physiological basis of uh our body so like our physiological processes that lead to healing or our normal responses um and then um health psychology um 
and then abnormal psychology. I, I always thought it was weird that everyone was so excited about abnormal psychology as like their favorite class. I was like, this is really boring. This is like, they look at diagnostic t statistical manual and then look at the, the, how you diagnose those things. And then the class format, which is horrible. I just, I was, I didn't understand it, but I was always, I was, inter I was interested in the health psychology. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is like the, the interesting, thing, like how people get well or how people experience wellness or health. Um, and some of the studies there. So kind of had a very, uh, always an interest in uh, health. Uh, but I was also preparing to, I took all my pre-med courses and I was preparing to go to a medical school. Um, then I, my dad came and then we decided to, I did decide to go on a road trip with him. And that road trip turned into living <laughs> in two years in Ashland, Oregon. Um, and so I, I was there and then also, town. yeah, <laughs> it's like a little vortex. You get stuck there. Uh, but yeah, uh, how would you describe Ashland to people who, uh, maybe are unfamiliar? Oh, with okay. It? Uh, well, one big thing they have there is the Situated. Shakespeare festival. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, Ashland is in a valley. I forget what the valley name is. Do you know? I'm not sure either, but it's situated. Years. Yeah. Between like beautiful mountains. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, for skiing. And so there's and like all this farmland around there. It's about um, six hours south of, uh, of Portland, close mm -hmm. to the border of California yeah. near, uh, Mount or Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots of natural springs around there. Natural spring. Well. Yeah. Lithia springs actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lithium used to be treat mood disorders. Interesting. And so there's like the waters are high in lithium there. Hmm. Um, so there was actually, I think there's like a health spa there. And then there's also a Jackson Well Springs, which is like, um, it's like a trailer park, and but they also have a common area that is a, po a pool with the Lithia spring water, um, and it's a hot pool also. Yeah, because when you mentioned um, uh, water therapy, like which was some of the origins of, of naturopathic medicine, I, yeah. I thought it was going to be related to. Uh, to spring water and consuming spring water oh yeah that, um, I, that's definitely part of it yeah. yeah yeah because with with spring water i have a little bit of history it was like about nine years ago now i got introduced to uh, a lot of uh loosely formulated research around the benefits of of drinking spring water but then oh. there's a there's a book i have up there i want to say it's victor schauberger and um, it was a book that talked, and I think he, he, he was also German. Um, it talked about water, the energy of water, um, how different types of vessels impact the energy of water, uh, UV light, how mm -hmm. it impacts water. And for about a year, I was collecting or foraging my own spring water using like glass containers. And that was the only water that I was like eating, drinking. Uh, I was still showering with regular water, but I was yeah. filtering it. Um, so that was that was uh, an interesting experience for some time. And so I, I can uh, resonate with people who decide to move near springs because it's oh, it's yeah. been yeah talked about how there's a lot of healing energy around natural springs. Uh, there's yeah. a website called findaspring.com. I think that still exists, and you can find springs all over the world. Yeah, I mean, just the practice itself is is really cool because. To be able to just drink water right out of the earth, you're, it, it's, it goes against everything I grew up in. You know, like you turn the, the faucet and then there's your water, but you don't really want to drink that water because it's it's rich in calcium. It's very salty also, mm -hmm. and they have to do all these processes because it's in Tucson and our water table is just dropping. And then so all of the well water comes out salty, and then we get a lot of water from the Colorado River, but it's all far away from us you know mm -hmm. we're getting all this water that's really far removed but then to go to a place where water's just bubbling up and you can drink that yeah i don't know that's invigorating i've I, I used to do that too <laughs> like in uh um in uh ashland oregon i'd go down to mount shasta heard a little beep yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i did too it's yeah. all good <laughs> uh but yeah we used to go to the the headwaters of the sacramento uh -huh. and so you see that water just busting out of the the shasta mountain and you just yeah, Mount Shasta, that. that's yeah. a place where a lot of people go to to get their spring water. But uh, like you were mentioning in Ashland, um, there's it, a lot of that stuff too. Yeah, Crystal Geyser is actually, they package their water from Mount Shasta. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah the most like common spring water that you can find in the store. It's, yeah, yeah, you nice. see the, there's Mount Shasta on the cover right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's really nice to, to just 
get it from the earth. I don't yeah. know. There's something very, pri- it strikes something very primal, I think, I in us. And you're like, at, uh, at your own this, discretion, this everyone, good. because like, yeah, it's important to know the quality of the water that you're getting and making sure that it's safe to drink. Usually if you see other people who are going there to get it, it's, yeah. it's okay. There's a place on Route 26 actually to the, oh, yeah, seen that. the coast. That it's um, sometimes. It almost looks like a f- spigot right they have yeah it on it's spigot. on both yeah. sides of the the road as well yeah. but um i'm sorry i didn't mean to take over uh, uh so you had moved you went on a road trip with your father it ended up being oh, yeah. two years in ashland, ashland oregon, oregon. Yeah. yeah and then I, I actually ended up going to massage school there at the ashland institute of massage um man massage just really brought me down to like this level of what, what healing actually can be and i just had some amazing experiences of of really feeling uh feeling welcomed in my body, you know. I think that's part of it. It's like maybe in, in my, my life, I just didn't feel like I was a little disconnected with my body. Um, maybe had some maybe body dysmorphia, just like negative feelings towards my body. And then to feel feel uh, healing or to feel like I love my, my body in massage, probably from it being just touched a lot, you know, being massaged on. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow. Why, don't, why didn't I know about this before, you know? I know kind of massage is kind of like a tool just to, you know, manipulate muscle but it has a, a lot of uh, psychological effects too um, touch in general no i've uh, i've definitely heard a lot about that i had some friends who are massage therapists in um in vermont so eight years ago i was teaching yoga and living in vermont after graduating college and I had a friend who was a massage therapist and that was one of the the experiences that she had as well that a lot of the people who were coming to her for massage um we're experiencing, of course, like benefits through relaxing tense muscles and, yeah. um, you know, things around that nature, but then also the effects of actually being touched because mm-hmm. a lot of people don't experience touch. And in acro yoga, something I've practiced a little bit of, of as well is like something else that draws people to it is the fact that there's a lot of um, partner contact yeah. in a, you know, non-sexual way it's just about the the physical practice but there really is something something to it uh that i've experienced and then that you were saying that you had as well it's like somebody actually touching you like human contact like it's important Uh, and bring it back to psychology a little bit um did you ever have you ever heard that study or read it about the rhesus monkeys i think it's the rhesus monkeys Mm -hmm. but they have like uh basically these little baby monkeys and they have a they they're they have two mothers, fake mothers. One is a caged wi- cage wire monkey. The other one is a cage wire monkey with like, that's soft. And the cage wire monkey, uh, or the, the monkeys that were put in that cage wire mon- monkey condition, they end up dying. And then the ones that are with that soft little welcoming furry thing, uh, they end up living <laughs> a end little longer. Uh, living, oh, they have their long. decrease of mortalities a lot less. But it, it's like, um, the soothing aspect, like the, those monkeys don't want to go towards that thing, that cage, but they want to go to this thing that's kind of comforting mm-hmm. and that actually helps them live. So I, it's just kind of interesting. Like it's a weird study. Um, I it's, but it's I one of the things we talk about psychology is like, but they talk a lot about it, like in developmental psychology too. They'll always put that, that study out there a little bit. It's like, oh, uh, nurturance and care is really important. Mm-hmm. And then it's about contact a lot too, physical contact. So and so you had that experience in uh, in Ashland that you yeah, very, decided to go to massage school after you had experienced massage or uh, oh no how did that work I, I was like I just kind of jumped in that's someone was like hey I think you'd be I actually I was giving massage because I used to do massage on my my dad a lot when I was younger he he taught me twina and so I do hand massages on him and then like so like acupressure yeah acupuncture? acupressure basically and so he <laughs> when i was younger he taught me massage. he like showed me how to massage and like what mm-hmm. it was like and then i think he just did that so i could <laughs> end up massaging his hand or something Interesting. It's, yeah it's funny uh but uh it was good it's kind of like a loving practice between mm-hmm. father and son just like uh, exchanging a hand massage um but i i now look at it like i end up giving him more hand massages than he gave me, yeah. You know, so like, hey, that's not fair. <laughs> I guess he deserves it. You know, he raised you and all. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I was always pretty good with my hands uh, uh-huh. from that. Basically, it just were happened. you climbing already at that time too? I started climbing when I was sixteen years old. Yeah, um, but when I went to massage school, I was like, man, this is going to be hard to climb in, like, because you end up getting calluses from and, giving massage or from oh, climbing? from climbing. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. you, you have your your calluses are thick and they can get scratchy and they don't mm-hmm. feel good on someone's skin. So yeah. I know I stopped, <laughs> I stopped climbing because of that. Um, 
But you have Massage School and Ashland, and this is in 2009. And then also um, I was apprenticing with a master farmer gardener. Mm -hmm. He was a, a farmer in Hawaii for 40 years. And so I was learning a lot about food systems and eating food that um, from a garden. Uh, so we'd get we'd eat pretty much everything. Like 90% of our food came from his garden. It was like amazing garden. Um, and then I got, got to work with him, learn his some of the things he did as a farmer. Um, and uh, yeah, he was like, "Hey Lee, you, you got to decide which way you're going. You know, are you gonna do massage? You're gonna do farming? What do you where do you want to go?" Um, so then I buckled down a little bit, went back went back to Tucson. Um, and ended up being a behavior health case manager. Did that for two years. So behavior health case manager at, at a state-funded health agency. And basically, you get to see a lot of people that have low income um, and would have behavior health problems or psychological problems. So they, in, the, in Arizona, they break up that, that field or, or the po patient population to three areas. You have general mental health, which could be like depression, anxiety kind of picture. Um, and then severe mental illness, which could be higher cases of bipolar, maybe a bit schizophrenia, like being a big one too. Mm -hmm. And then uh, alcohol and substance abuse. So kind of there's like three funding areas for those areas. So I, I work with general mental health uh, persons, people with general mental health issues. And as a case manager, you basically do, you do an intake and they do a biopsychosocial screening. So looking at someone's biology, what's going on, psychology, what's going on mentally, and then all the sociological factors surrounding their life. And so you get a pretty big picture um, of them at doing that intake. And then you just refer them maybe to therapy with their count, a counselor, mm -hmm. uh, or you refer them to a psychiatrist. And that's most often what happened. You take, you refer them to the psychiatrist and they get their psychiatric meds. Um, and then uh, what are some other things? Oh, the other things were like referring them to other social services around town. So as a case manager, I was kind of like that in between for all those Did a lot of paperwork, a lot of patient contact. Um, and uh, there's actually the first time I w did it, my first like week as a case manager, I did a home visit and the person was just coming off, uh, I think methamphetamines and they were having a little bit of a break, like a psychotic break. And they're, their kid was there and the kid was like hyperventilating on the couch and we're like, what's going on? Found out the person, the kid had um, diabetes and had, wasn't being administered insulin for a long time. And so basically was going into ketoacidosis, which is life threatening. Um, but uh, it, yeah, after doing that home visit, it was like, man, all the things that we do really it's, it's not going to change how this person is living their lifestyle. So that's one of that's one of those pitiful experiences. Was like seeing that what I was doing probably wasn't actually doing that much, or I didn't feel like it was doing that much. Uh, so I felt like a little disempowered within my job, and then doing all the paperwork and all that, and then also looking for something that I can give my all and be continually, basically working on bettering myself, um, and also kind of had some ethos around it and the ethos surrounding like our relationship to the planet because I think that's important that's like the biggest thing that is uh, leading to a lot of health issues it, it stems down to how we relate to the world and how we see the world so based in philosophy a little bit mm -hmm. so if we are constantly reducing the minute things in the world it's a process of examination and ripping apart it's very destructive I'd say so like you look at farming like for me like looking at farming systems is like oh yeah we can see that like doing monocultures for productivity to get plant but then that's monoculture just growing like a lot of wheat or corn yeah and one field so one, field. one cr crop and doing it for a long time and then supplementing it with uh, uh, fertilizers mm -hmm. so not listening to the old age-old crop rotations that they did to replenish the soil but also the these tree lines that created bi biodiversity or the far small scale farming that were kind of more closely knit and they had a large diversity of bi large biodiversity. Um, but like th those systems were closer to how the life functions on earth, I think uh, the, the small scale farm and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then you get these larger scale farms that are kind of more industrialized, more streamlining things, all about productivity. Um, uh, you start, and that goes, I think that relates to a philosophical view, view of the world, of how we treat the world. Um, 
So I went into medicine that kind of had the opposite, that looked at more of a holistic picture, that saw relationships between things as important and then appreciated the diversity of, of species, of plants, or, or the diversity within our body and treated those aspects of a person. So outside of just honing in on someone's biology, which is, um, or a defect in someone's biology, looking more into someone's psychology a little bit more, and then the sociological factors, which I think are the bigger picture surrounding us. So a medicine that kind of integrated those kind of things. And so when you say like looking at somebody's biology, does that mean like if I came uh, to a to a doctor and I mentioned something that was bothering me, then it would just be a, a matter of tests for like blood markers or yeah. like hormones. Yeah, just or, within your body. So mm -hmm. like I think what often happens in medicine is we look at a problem and we look at it as something that's happening specifically within that individual. Like there's mm -hmm. a defect, there's a disease process happening within me. Um, but when you go to psych, we look at psychology. Sometimes it's like whoa. No, this is the dimensions of disease and health are all engaged into biology, psychology, and sociology. Um, so, looking That's at sociology being like socioeconomic factors, like exactly and, and yeah. that and, being and related to the food systems as well. Kind yeah, of like and that, that being even to... further out from that biopsychosocial theory, which would be environmental. So, mm -hmm. biopsycho social geo theory, theory, I think, would be a better thing. Oh, so if you're in, uh, I've heard the term. Um, food desert like if you're not close to a place where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables does that kind of relate to the geo uh yeah i'd, I'd say so i mean the uh, like geo being the earth right like but oh, okay uh, that that'd be a more of a social social logical mm -hmm. issue that there's a food desert there food desert being like there's not a grocery store that's what it refers to within mm -hmm. walking distance oh, okay okay uh, that's what food deserts refer to like there might not be a grocery store nearby but there's a food there's a, food there's restaurant. a convenience store or yeah, something convenience that has store. all packaged foods so you can't get at, you don't have access to like a whole foods mm -hmm. uh, meals and stuff um, so you're like actual whole foods, not necessarily just the, yeah, yeah. Store. Like the plants and the, <laughs> yeah, not packaged, anything that's packaged, you're like, Ugh. uh, but yeah, convenience storage and stuff like that, that they basically, it's, I think it has to be in walking distance, but, so uh, that, uh, that time that you came back to Arizona and when you were working as a case manager, that was kind of like the spark for you to, to I'd say decide. that, yeah, that was yeah. a big spark for me. Um, and then, uh, I was kind of examining what direction I should go. Um, I talked, was able to talk to some of the psychiatric nurses there, uh, some of the, the psychiatrists, which are the medical doctors, mm -hmm. um, and then some of the counselors. So I got a kind of intro to what they do uh, and what they did. Um, so I was like, saw what nursing was like on this mm -hmm. field for uh, psych, psych, psychiatric nursing, and then what it's like for a psychiatrist as a medical doctor, and then what it's like to be a counselor. And this would be all within a state fund agency. I was like, man. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I really want to do these things. And then I don't really, there the treatments are always kind of get reduced to doing just like uh, a lot, a lot of time um, just doing some kind of pharmaceutical care. Um, so prescribing yeah. pharmaceutical medication. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I was like, man, I, I don't, I don't see that. I haven't seen that in my time as a case manager to be incredibly helpful for those people. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the studies only show them to be used like in a six month period, you know, so they're not, necessary studied for over a long period of time before mm -hmm. they're put out and approved by the FDA. Um, so I, just noticing that, you know, I didn't think this was effective. Uh, I was looking for something that was effective that also it ha probably was more close to my, my ethos and my, my beliefs systems about how I get, how the world would be better in functioning. So like more of a holistic approach that understood that all those little factors, the biology, the psychology, sociology and then the the earth you know and, and engage all those aspects um so i f found naturopathic medicine along and along that path of looking um and i think th i think the principles are one of the big things that got to me but also if you look at our like our oath as a profession it basically says uh to ensure the health of life for the future generations so ensuring planetary health basically too so it's part of my professional oath it's like it's like planetary health is part of what i try to do so looking at interventions that are gonna i try i try to do interventions that um basically understand like this you know you can't do fish oils all all the time you know 
like you're depleting the resources in the ocean. Maybe there's other ways to get omega threes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's like engaging this this world, this view that uh, maybe a, a lot of the healing we can do is within ourselves, and then we don't, and it has to do with our nutrition and how we do those things. So, uh, Lee rode his bike here, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think my my story of getting to naturopathic medicine is pretty is kind of complex, like with most. Uh, people's uh, stories of how they enter the profession. A lot of people have like a healing story, I'd say, in my, my profession. Like mm -hmm. uh, they like have naturopathic medicine did something for yeah, them. Yeah, they did something for them and they're like, whoa, I was like, what is going on here? What, are, what mm -hmm. is this thing doing? Um, I think that's how a lot of people get introduced to it and then like want to pursue it as a career. For me, it's more like, um, philosophically as like, man, I, I'm, phys I'm a philosophically driven person mm -hmm. and so I need to have something that I feel activates me um I, I think the the over if i was going to sum it up i'd sum it up by uh this uh, in one experience with my brother uh who's very pivotal in my life but my brother rudy he came back from mexico and he was a human rights activist doing some human rights act activism down in chiapas mexico mm -hmm. and the zapatistas uh and he, he's like yeah there's all these like these this white guy who's just yelling at people trying to like get him riled up and like he's like I didn't see that all that anger and then it translating into being effective and then he thought it'd be more effective to come back home and to see how our systems of oppression are, are affecting the people in different countries and for him it, he took the statement and he brought it to me it's called ya basta enough already in spanish that to me that meant like enough of these systems of oppression that are leading to these things and so i'm, I'm looking for ways to be free and to have freedom in life and to practice a medicine that gives people the freedom of choice and then gives them some freedom in their health so a lot of what i try to do is about education um but also to just show people and also to help people see that they have more control in their bodies than they know like those experiences with the water you know like mm -hmm. the, the earth can give us something if we just appreciate it in a, a way you know like that that feeling that primal feeling that you get with getting water right yeah it's, it's really like, interesting that it feels weird yeah whereas if it was uh like before like i think like the modern uh like plumbing systems and sewage treatment centers that that we have that are fantastic because of course like they clean a lot of water that is dirty for whatever reasons yeah. like existed you'd have to get your water from either your well or somewhere where there's a spring yeah or, or if you live in a desert you know like you don't have yeah to. what would you do if you lived in the desert and yeah you i think you'd water? go with well you know or cactus <laughs> you, yeah. you dig down <laughs> maybe yeah you, 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 you live near like a, mm -hmm. a stream bed because if you actually dig down there's water underneath hmm. like, two, like sometimes three feet it's just not running on top yeah we're really, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm really fortunate that I've never had uh, an experience where I wasn't able to get like clean drinking water yeah. or um, the fact that I can like go to somewhere oftentimes driving because it's like I'm filling up maybe I used to fill up around like 30, 35 gallons of water. Oh yeah. So that's really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Times that by eight. Yeah. And I wasn't <laughs> living near it. I wasn't living near enough to it where you would walk. Um, wait, you would, you would get like 200 gallons of water. Oh, you, well, you said. Oh no, I was getting gallons. thirty around like thirty, thirty-five gallons. Oh yeah, yeah. Times that by eight would be. Um, sorry, the I think it's eight pounds per gallon. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. okay, so okay. For the weight, the 200, 240 pounds of weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like sixty miles. That's that's serious business. But um, yeah, so I'm really thankful and appreciative of the fact that like we have access. It's seemingly, yeah. it, it feels like it's unlimited, but I know it's not unlimited. Um, access to clean drinking water so having that experience and knowing the just how good i feel when i have enough water yeah. um yeah is is that sort of a i don't know like a, a small personal experience that anyone can share that if they drink enough water and stay enough you know hydrated enough like the the actual feelings of well-being that come from something so simple uh, oh, it as like a, a daily practice I think so. I think, uh, I mean, there's a daily practice of like kind of gratitude of examining how things get here. I think that's, a, that's pretty amazing. Um, I mean, it's very, our, our society is complex, man. It's, it's like, uh, I, I think the, the simpler we can make it for ourselves and, uh, to see those processes makes it easier. But I think having gratitude is one of the key things to having a healthy mind. Um, 
but like in regards to like getting water at a stream that connection with the earth there mm -hmm. i think um that's if you don't like grow your own food and then but if you can get water from that it's very easy for everyone to do that mm -hmm. to get water at a spring water it's yeah i think that that connection to having to the earth is really important because we're a little disconnected in cities you know we do get you have a, a garden now too uh i have an apartment complex mm -hmm. i live in so it's kind of like hard to get a garden uh Ashley, she's actually my girlfriend. She's gonna, she has access to a garden at her work, so mm -hmm. she's gonna start planting that. But um, I have kombucha growing in the in the oh, you do? kitchen. Oh, yeah, nice. I'll show you my scoby. scoby. Yeah. yeah, let me see your scoby. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something really interesting how uh, caring for so a scoby is the uh, living bacteria that you need to um, create what becomes the drink kombucha. Um, but I've, I've, I've got some seedlings too. And sometimes I grow my own sprouts. There's something really interesting about like actually caring for and then watching, um, your own food grow. Yeah. I mean, kombucha is a beverage and it's, I don't know about this nutritional values behind it, but something like sprouts, which you can grow pretty much anywhere. Really easily, you don't really yeah. need much light or water or space. Um, I have a friend that was growing, uh, sun, I forget the, awesome. the grass. What, what's that? You need some sun. Yeah. Oh, a little yeah, bit of sun. Yeah. 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 Um, wheatgrass. He was growing wheatgrass with a little um, like fluorescent tube. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you that there's there's a connection there that that feels like it's coded into our DNA in some yeah, way. Yeah. The, um, I mean, like I was like another book. Have you read Guns, Germs, and Steel? Uh, Jared Diamond, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, parts of it. Yeah, it was a that, it was a text. The Maori and the Maori, the like the food system where people the agriculture. One of the, those people had developed an agricultural system, mm -hmm. and then it led to he. His explanations it led to greater levels of I mean, actually, oh wait, yeah, a agriculture led to the ability to store food. And that means you didn't have to go around and search for food all the time. So you was able to spe people were able to specialize in certain things. So then, in a way, it led to more, more hierarchies in society eventually. Hmm. Um, I th I'm probably missing a step there, but I think that's the, the gist of it. And then the other group, which were pretty much part of the same kind of lineage of people, um, they remained close to their harvesting and their foraging, and their society was more egalitarian. And all they had, they did, spent most of their time looking for food, gathering food. Um, but there was no also pot, there's no lack of food for them. They just had to forage it. Um, and so they didn't have as much specialization, but like one of the things they talk about is like how their, uh, the farming system was able to specialize in warfare also. And so when they came to these areas, they just dominated these people and like took the resources that were there. Um, but food systems, you know, I, I think, do bring us <laughs> i don't know why i brought that up exactly but the, they do bring us back in touch to how things are yeah. um, i think they're connect it, they're it's connected, connected to yeah. the to the whole or yeah to the way that you're seeing uh like wellness right yeah I, it's tough I, certain words uh, carry a lot of baggage around them and oh, i think uh, wellness, wellness is, is definitely <laughs> yeah, one of those definitely one of those um everybody has their own interpretation of what it means and i think the definition of health mentioned. is more important not many people don't know what health is yeah how how do you define that for someone like if somebody asked you like lee what do i need to do to Dr. Dr. Poe, what do I need to do to get healthy? Yeah, yeah. What What is my definition of health? Yeah, yeah. I think that if you're going to ask a healthcare provider something, I think that would be the biggest thing you want from them. As like, hey, what's health? If someone says the absence of disease, that's actually if you look in like any of the dictionary, any dictionary about uh, health, they're like, it, health is not is more than just the absence of disease, but they don't say exactly what it is. But I would break it up into three major components. Mm -hmm. So physical, emotional, and mental. And then physical would be ideally the freedom to move and the freedom from disease, that, those kind of aspects. So it goes back to that one definition. And then emotional would be the ability to experience a full range of human emotion and not getting stuck in it. So not getting full stuck range. in one st emotion for a long time. Um, so I, I could speak to that. That like I think a little, and probably men and and men in general, a lot of the emotions that I think men express are anger initially, but that's because I think a lot of it's we're culturally taught to respond in that way. But when we're sometimes feeling, and I noticed this for myself, that when I was actually feeling angry, it was actually, I was, um, not, I was out of touch with feeling sad, you know? 
so it got expressed as anger like uh, that uh, that actually hurt me you know so resisting something. expressing one emotion but yeah so there's a little suppression kind of going on just not really seeing that so being more connected with those things and being able to recognize them and then f feel the whole experience and then mental health would be clarity coherence of thought and creative service to others uh, so it, it kind of reaches also that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which at the top of that, it's a, it's a it's, he's a guy in psychology, but basically he says like, you know, we have these phys base physiology needs. So food, water, shelter. And then above that we have like, you know, we need more social needs maybe, or self-esteem needs. So I need to feel confident in my life. And then I need to feel loved in my life and have a support network. And then above, above that, he has like self-actualization, which is that mental health, mm -hmm. that mental health portion where we're, we're creative service to others. We're helping other people and we have cl clear and coherent thoughts. Um, so I would, I would break up health into those three way, ways, kind of engages a little bit of that comes a little bit from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then also this guy that's a homeopathic, uh, do, who was a homeopathic doctor, his name is Vitulkas. And uh, surprisingly, you know, that's like the best definition of health I've read is from a homeopathic. So physical, doctor. emotional, and mental. Yeah, that's how I would I would define it. And I think people probably, depending on what the take, are, take is, and this isn't my, where I would be part of someone's health, I think it's more leading to whatever religion or spirituality they believe in. I think spirituality may be part of that too for mm -hmm. some people. And that's up just to the person to see um, where their belief system lies. And that's why I think narrative is really important too, is appreciating one's narrative and one their, one's story um, and then seeing how they can live to their highest potential in their story, to be like basically the protagonist in their, their story, to be the hero. Um, so, but yeah. Those are. <laughs> that's a good. That's you know, I re yeah, I really like. I really like thinking about it like that, um, because I also understand that within each one of those three, or maybe then four, um, like categories, there's so many practices mm -hmm. that are not necessarily even independent of that category yeah. because they'll influence like the other one. So if you're talking about like even just exercise, you know, it's. Um, a physical practice that transpires into creating, you know, the ability to, to maybe maintain a, a more balanced emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it could be a physical practice that has components of, um, you know, working with other people. So yeah. maybe then building community there, um, which is something that I think about often with, with various like physical pursuits that I've had or currently have and um, identifying pieces of those practices that um, now as I'm, you know, as whatever my practice is now, like I've been practicing jujitsu and then I do some, some climbing at the gym and then some of my own. Jiu-Jitsu. Um, <laughs> my, my, my ribs are hurt. Oh, really? My ribs are hurt. Uh, yeah. I'll have to talk to you about that. <laughs> later, I, but, I grew up doing uh, martial arts with uh, my dad I'm banged too, up yeah. at the moment <laughs> and it kind of sucks. I can't go surfing. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but I appreciate physical practices, exercise that, um, yeah, kind of ha hits, checks off more than one box. Yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't just get me strong, but maybe gets me strong with a group of people. Uh, and also has, components of a, of a more like med meditative practice in them as well. Um, so if a patient came to you and um, they person, were- Person. A person. I, I like to think of like, oh. yeah. But anyways, yeah. No, 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 yeah. Person, so I, I, so uh, why is that? Why would you, uh, uh, yeah, call- uh, I mean, I, I would like to view mm -hmm. people as people first, mm -hmm. as a person first, and their individuality re is recognized versus the authority that I would have over them as a patient doctor, yeah. I think person is person-centered mm -hmm. care. Everyone says patient-centered care, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's still oh. embedded in that I'm the health authority. You're going to listen to everything I say in a way. Well, oh, I really, so really the term like patient, that. But person-centered care. Yeah. yeah, I would say person. Uh, but if actually, a person comes to me, yeah. Yeah. Well, hmm, you know what? Before, before I get to that question, uh, this is actually a question that um, was asked to be asked of you. Um, how would someone go about finding... Uh, a naturopathic physician for them? Like, what are the qualities that mm. you would recommend looking for um, yeah. in that um, physician? Yeah, um, I would take a step back and go back to that question that we asked. What, what, what 
what question should you ask a health care provider? Mm-hmm. And that'd be, hey, what's your definition of health? Like, what are, we, what are your goals? You know, I, if you're interviewing a health care provider and you have that time and you can do that, I, would, I think that'd be a good question. And then you can see if that kind of aligns with what you think about health. Because I think those two things of having alignment actually gets the best results. You know, like if you think that person is going to do the same thing or similar thing that you would do with it, but they have a higher set of knowledge, um, then you're going to be more willing to follow what they're doing. And that has its own benefits, you know, of like that belief in something. And that goes into placebo a bit, right? Is like the believing that is going to do something has a, a healing benefit as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but what the qualities I would look for in search, if I was say, if I was going to look for a naturopathic uh, doctor, um, I think one of the, the big things I would I'd look for is is how they how they relate to someone is one of the things, but also like how they approach um, their in their their field. So I think there's a little bit of a I, I would want someone that basically has that holistic approach, right? What does that mean? Is that they're they're gonna see how see me as a whole person, not as a patient at first, and then. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's actually else, kind of a hard question for me to answer because it's like yeah. So I, I attended a, a lecture that you gave uh, just, around fasting, and one of the things that actually you mentioned to me, which made a lot of sense to me as well, was um, what does the person look like? Yeah, yeah. You know, the the person that is going to be working with you to uh, hopefully remedy some sort of disease that you have in your in your life, are they representing? like a picture of health that you'd want to yeah you know have in your in yourself i think that's part of it i think that's part of the field too is like uh naturopaths as role models of what are we doing what we're saying Mm -hmm. you know are we living to that that kind of that true the truth of what we think the world is being like how we can conduct ourselves i think that's part of it um but i mean disease also can you know take hold take foot and sometimes we don't have 100% 100% control of it. And that's kind of the interesting part, thing about disease is we lose it, our, our ability to control, you know, our, our autonomy as a person. And we kind of become part of this disease state and we have to live with it in a way. But sometimes people own it to their complete, to be like, I'm this disease in a way. Um, and that's kind of, that's troublesome. That's hard. But um, yeah, I think role modeling is, is part of it. And I think it's a big part of what I, I try to do is I want to role model what I want in the world and how I want to treat health and how I want to live healthily in the world and uh, how I'd like to inspire people. So like me riding my bike every day is kind of as a statement, you know, like it's, it's cause I'm driven philosophically. It's like the statement that like, Hey, it's possible to do this. And it has, you know, it's not cause I want to get physical activity. It's cause I want to enjoy riding my bike. Uh, it slows down and I can look at things a little bit more and it's, I don't have to deal with traffic in the same way as it, as you're driving. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has those benefits. And then the, the other one is the byproduct of all that is I get a, get some physical activity and I guess that has health benefits, you know? Yeah. yeah traffic feel, is stressful. Yeah. It's traffic is stressful. <laughs> it's, even at a, at, at the lowest level of traffic or I find just driving in general, there's yeah. a baseline of stress that. I, I love to walk like I walk or yeah. jog to the to the gym or to the grocery store when I can whenever I can um, I just know for a fact that like it's way more relaxing and feels better to avoid if possible like yeah. being in a car being on alert for people you know who who might be driving a little bit aggressively yeah um, yeah so small habit that that does a a big difference i i think the the real modeling one is a big thing and then i think the narrative piece too is like Mm -hmm. being understanding who you are as a person and then what you're looking for in the world too i think you'll find people that will help you out through that process um now there's that sense of that there might be a confirmation bias you know you're only going to see what you want to see or no you know you'll only find what you the knowledge that's going to confirm your beliefs so um, I think someone having someone that also is a critical thinker, you know, that and that's what being a doctor is about is like you have to be able to critically, critically analyze the situation to think critically about a situation, not just like execute some dogmatic treatment or protocol, but look really deeply into something, into the problem um, and 
see it not just as like a, a one component, you know, oh yeah, there's this um, defect in your, um, your receptor here um, it versus, you know, you could look at it narrowly that way, but you could also see, okay, I know, I know that there's a defect in this receptor here. What are all the things doing that I can do to help you surround this that can help improve the functionality of your body or this process? So that, that kind of critical thinking of outside of just looking at mechanistically what's mm -hmm. happening and then giving a mechanistic treatment, but, um, but giving a whole, very whole wide range of treatments. So if you, how do you measure someone if they're a critical thinker, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's, uh, a, that's another question. And yeah. uh, the, the analogy that you just gave, um, I'm wondering, uh, one of the ways that I sometimes best understand concepts is uh, through examples that maybe like I myself have, mm. have experienced in life. Um, could you maybe elaborate that concept with something like if somebody's experiencing like gastrointestinal distress? Oh, it's something very specific. Yeah, and okay. maybe I, I don't know if it's if fair or possible if if you would be able to kind of like compare how, um, like a traditional doctor would possibly diagnose it versus the approach that like you would take as a naturopathic oh, physician. Okay. Um, um, or you could just maybe talk about yeah um, it from the naturopathic's perspective. Let's see. I think like diet because uh, like there are a couple questions that that uh, folks had on diet. And yeah, maybe um, I'll go into uh, SIBO. Have you heard of that? Small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Small? No. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. it's it's basically it is a diagnosis recognized in the medical field but it's usually a part of something else is a larger it called condition. candida as well no that's something else that'd okay. be yeast uh -huh. um but maybe candida mm -hmm. yeah so let's do uh, say if you had like a yeast infection somewhere mm -hmm. uh let's say it's a, <laughs> say gastrointestinal you have overgrowth of yeast then you'd give maybe a drug to kill the yeast right that's like the idea. That's kind of a germ theory model, you know, like you have some, an organism and you, it's causing a problem, you need to kill it. A naturopath will look at that and be like, why is that yeast growing there? Like it usually doesn't grow there. What are the other factors creating that? And it goes back to that term, the old naturopathic term terrain. So uh, you're like, why, why is the terrain allowing this thing to be here? So it's a, it's a big question, like what purpose is this serving? Is it, is it just an issue that our body is failing to, to, to do something? Is our body just failing to do something? Or is it something that we're missing? So maybe it's like, uh, you know, you had some nutritional deficiency that led to your, your body's, lowered your body's ability to actually detect and monitor these issues. Maybe it has to do with new research on like microbiome, you know, something intestinally, what's going on. There's a dysbiosis going on. So it's allowing overgrowth. And th that actually has to do with what you've been eating too, because you, what you've been eating has been feeding different microbes in different ways, leading to different populations of certain things. Does yeast grow on sugar? What's that? that? Yeast. Uh, oh yeah, they love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how like you know you brew. Yes, yeah, so my scoby, yeah. <laughs> my kombucha. That's yeah, it growing. loves that sugar. Yeah, yeah uh, the process for making kombucha is essentially you make tea, you add a lot of sugar, sugar into yeah. it, and then you add the the bacteria, the scoby, and they and eat then it the up. Bacteria yeah. grows on the scoby, uh, and it is growing. It yeah. is growing so it's well. It's like thick, isn't it? It's like, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's all it's doing all sorts of different things. Um, yeah, it's exciting to watch and then to also sample a little bit yeah. of the, the kombucha. So, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so, as a naturopath, you would you would really look to see what's causing the conditions in the terrain, yeah. the physical terrain. For and, the, and then you have to evaluate, you kind of have to risk stratify, you know. Mm -hmm. Is it at a point where it's going to cause severe problems and it needs to be killed, you know? Mm -hmm. Or is it a point where you can manage it by trying to adjust the terrain and then it you're allowing your body to handle it mm -hmm. from there. So as a naturopath, do you prescribe, um, uh, would you prescribe medications to like kill that, that yeast growth? Depends, possibly? you know, I, uh, like that, that's kind of like last line for me. Like, mm -hmm. um, but some people, you know, they've been dealing things with things for a long time and then those can have some unwanted side effects, you know, like, you know, someone like example would be, uh, you, you get, you get treatment for some uh, bacterial infection, you get antibiotics, and then that, and the antibiotics could destroy your microbiome and then could lead to maybe getting another bac severe bacterial infection 
called Clostridium difficile. difficile. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's called difficile. Um, but uh, that's that's life threatening, you know. And that's uh, maybe then also it could cause the antibiotics can lead be associated with ulcerative colitis, you know. Like so, so it could they, those things come with a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. I'd say there's a, a lot of pharmaceuticals are heavy them. hitting. They they do their job pretty dang well, mm -hmm. but they also are kind of like a you know we're putting this thing that's not normally in our body and our body's gonna it's not it doesn't have always the it responds to it in a way that's like okay this is abnormal you know so mm -hmm. it, it it can adjust so um it, it's basically like sometimes it throws homeostasis a little out of balance mm -hmm. and then your body's like whoa that's, this is out of whack i need to make an adjustment here or it does or maybe in the antibiotic case it's, it's ki it killed off a bunch of the that bacteria and that colon that then not just the bad bacteria but the, the good, the good bacteria. one yeah so then it's like okay now we don't have anything there and we need we need that those things there for normal function and we're just figuring out oh that we need those things you know there's this like kind of this 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 idea of super a super organism you know that we're just not by ourselves you know we're actually made up of a bunch of different organisms that are kind of collaborating and have the synergism that's going on um, and we're just beginning to understand that relationship. So I think that germ, the germ theory of disease where it's like, oh, it's always nice to find an infection that has like a, a big impact and then be able to kill it. And then mm -hmm. you see these changes in our lifespan and our decreased rates of infectious disease, which is awesome. But then at the, the trade off, you know, you get different, we're living longer and stuff. And so we get diseases more of like kind of like long life but <laughs> um and so speak speaking of diet to not long um, life sorry but diseases of like having uh living a longer life but also uh yeah it's not long lo long life could be healthy but i misspoke there anyways but what was your question uh no no, no. <laughs> i was i was uh was gonna ask kind of uh, uh again kind of keeping the topic around diet um yeah. so like you're a strong dude like i've seen you in the gym several times doing the one-arm pull-ups uh, and you're lean. So you're like, if somebody was looking for a naturopathic physician and you were looking at someone and you were like, Oh, like I want to look like them. They look like they're healthy. Like, you know, you have no, no. nice skin and you've got a great <laughs> photo on your, your card and also on your website. I got to uh, thank Jeremiah Deasy. That guy. <laughs> upheaval. Shout guy. out. Yeah, yeah. Shout out. Hey, you're taking a great photo. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, your advice around diet? Diet, and yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you have general guidelines because it's it's such an individual it's such an individual thing. But yeah, I think yeah. there's certain um, characteristics of an approach to finding healthy food that are more universal than like a diet that would be uh, prescribed to someone. Like, yeah, what are what are yeah. your guidelines around a, a healthy diet? Yeah. Um... Let's see. Like, well, you, I, I'm going to go with about, like, what do you, yeah, eat? yeah. I'm going to go do a little history for us, yeah. uh, for myself. You know, I, I grew up eating a lot of pasta, a lot of thing, a lot of restaurant food. I ate fast food. Um, and then when I was 21, I started gardening and I was like, oh, what have I been doing? <laughs> and I ate like, I, I, I think I tell you the story. I ate a tomato, like a garden, gro garden. a garden grown tomato. Yeah. And I was like, this is never, this doesn't taste like a tomato I've ever had, you know? And so then I realized like, oh, some of the foods we eat are actually not very nutrient poor, you know? So that, the idea of farm fresh food or garden fresh, it's like, it, it's alive, you know? It, it doesn't have that, that kind of time it needs to travel and then it loses nutrient value from that, that period where it travels. Um, and it's just there. And that tastes so much different. Um, so then the- So I'm gonna put that disclaimer that it's like, it's, you know, I didn't always eat well, you know, I didn't grow up that, I had to learn how to do this and it took time. Um, and is that taste reflective of uh, like the nutritional value yeah, yeah. in that food, the oh, yeah, mineral content? Sure. Yeah, I, that comes from the soil, right? Like that's yeah. I think I mean the soil is going to have a big part of it. Um, I mean we think of the soil with like the nutrients, but also there's the microorganisms that make that soil like those nutrients available for those plants. So there's like a whole set of you know science of seeing that that area is a super organ organism as well. You know like, like how things are all an organism. Yeah, I, maybe I misspoke there, superorganism, but like there's a lot of more connections that we have than just looking at kind of like the physical parts of it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a lot more th that goes into uh, having a, a very tasty and vibrant tomato than um, 
than just adding fertilizer and the yeah. polished look that you see <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. so i'm uh, sorry so you were saying you had that experience with tasting that that tomato that was yeah yeah next level but uh tomato yeah speaking of like diet and guidelines like so it's it's it takes time to adjust diet, you know, like mm -hmm. I think sometimes you have to have a pivotal experience where you see something and experience something different that makes you, or that opens you up to the world of possibility. Otherwise, you know, we live a lifestyle of like, oh, this is okay, you know, I'm getting by, this has always worked and it's not, you know, I don't see the, the, the harmful effects of it yet. So then we proceed. Um, and then if you're kind of like the preemptive person, you know, like that contingency planner, then you're probably looking at these things like your health and you're kind of paranoid about it. And then you get inspired about doing these things. But most of the time, you know, we, it's like we do the things that are easy for us. And the things that are easier for, for us is to get fast food, to eat on the go, to not take the time. We know we live this, this well, lifestyle of pro the idea of productivity. You know, we have to be productive all our time. You know, we don't live in a life where we value, we actually value humans. We live in a life that we value our productivity and then efficiency and getting things done the most, you know? So that's why we're always trying to cut costs and things. But um, as far as like, I think dealing with what's going surrounding you, having a pivotal experience to to see that maybe there is a change in food is necessary. And what would that change in food be, you know? It's like the standard American diet uh, is, have you, what's that, what's that, uh, that show where he eats fast food and he does he McDonald's uh, every day? No, it was a filmmaker. Sick. Um, yeah, no, it was an experiment. Morgan Spurlock yeah. was the filmmaker and he, yeah, his experiment was to see what his life would be like if he had only food that came from yeah. McDonald's for 30 days. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was the idea. I mean, Morgan Spurlock, I, I don't know the name of the, the film, but... Yeah, so, I mean, there are people that on that extreme, you know, that are living yeah. that lifestyle of eating that, and then there's people that are living, they live on a, maybe a farm, or they have their own garden, and they can get all their food sourced mm -hmm. from that. Um, and, or there's even maybe that extreme of people that still, that... We, that are foraging more, you know, too. Maybe that, but there's that. Uh, we don't know much about that. Maybe they're in the Amazon, I don't know. You can do it here in Portland yeah. uh, for, for the right season. There's a lot of plums, apricots, uh, Yeah, figs. wild harvesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like guidelines, you know, I think it, 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 the other thing we could look at is like uh, blue zones and stuff. And those are where people, lit, there's a high concentration of people that live over 100 or that live mm -hmm. into old age. So it's centur centur centurions. Centurions. Yeah. Um, but um, th those people mostly have like a plant-based diet and some protein, you know. We, and, and in the United States, we're on this huge protein fix. Everyone thinks they need more protein than they need. Um, but we d really don't need that much protein, you know. And we don't really need that much meat. And we eat, we're a meat-heavy society, you know. Mm -hmm. we're, or we're like cow country society. Everyone wants a burger, red meat, chicken, you know. And we don't really need to eat those things that much. And it shows like sometimes those those products actually c create like um, have molecular f biochemical specific biochemical pathways that that lead to increase rates or, or increase our susceptibility to disease to disease. Um, so a guideline would be like you know eating whole foods, plant based diet, uh, monitoring knowing where your food source comes from, especially mm -hmm. for meats, being aware of that. Um, and then also, um, so when you say eliminating processed foods mm -hmm. and then also decreasing no added sugars, I'm not really big on a specific diet. Mm -hmm. I'm more about like more intuitive eating, but also, uh, just looking at nutrition from a, a whole view of understanding where it comes from and how it's like how it's going to go in your body. And so, uh, plant-based I feel is, is the term that kind of has been um, popular in the past just a yeah. couple of years really but yeah. like when you say plant-based because um when i moved to portland nine years ago i was eating a raw or i was kind of following like a raw vegan diet lifestyle I did that for a little bit too <laughs> <laughs> which uh which was its own experience yeah. i did that for yeah. about a year nice but experiment. on that diet i was not eating anything that was like cooked above a certain temperature which is i think like 100 and 20 something degrees yeah. Fahrenheit and I was eating a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of nuts. 
and a lot of avocados a lot of avocados <laughs> so many avocados <laughs> do you like uh, eating avocados i, no. I actually I, I i've identified that i have an allergy to avocados oh yeah just a few weeks ago i i cut out avocados what kind of do you have a reaction to it you have... yeah i had i have some like dry scalp that oh it's also... probably a, maybe a sensitivity then yeah, yeah 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 more of a sensitivity yeah. yeah nothing nothing serious okay but um plant-based um when you say it because like you also eat meat i eat meat now too after being vegetarian for 20 years about two years ago i started eating meat and mm-hmm. i feel fantastic um plant-based doesn't necessarily mean like vegan it just means more that you're or the way that you're kind of talking about it that you're eating a lot of plants a lot of fruits a lot of vegetables yeah, yeah. and then you still do consume like animal products like eggs mm-hmm. meat dairy stuff like that exactly yeah i'm a little i'm more cautious with those things i want to mm-hmm. know where the animal came from i mm-hmm. think that's my my big shtick these days um so, I mean, if if you drive down I-5 in California and you see those large cattle farms mm-hmm. just on the side and they just look like desolate wastelands and they just bring in a bunch of hay and those cows live a miserable life, you know, and I don't, I don't want to be part of creating that miserable life within the cow. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think I am projecting about that, how life is miserable for that cow because it looks horrible. Imagine just being in a wasteland. And when a cow appears, you know, the picture perfect cow is the, the cow in the pasture, right? Uh, it's eating fresh grass yeah. and stuff like that. And so they don't get that opportunity uh, to do that. I mean, so I do have that kind of ethical appeal about um, where the meat comes from, but mm-hmm. also it has to do with, you know, how we treat life broadly. And I don't want to be part of a, a system that basically is captivating that creature in that, that way and then as, as just raising it just to be eaten in, in that way and i don't have anything against ranchers in that in that regard but like those cattle farms that are just like appeared and closed that don't go out and those cows don't go out to rancher like mm-hmm. ranch lands and stuff like that it's kind of it's it saddens me and i think a lot of the meat that we get comes from those kind of like those those factory um, farms right there and so um with with diet when someone's diet is um out of homeostasis is it common for people to be experiencing um the kind of like effects of that diet not being like aligned through like skin conditions or i think in part yeah i mean some of the research is showing that diet is kind of having you know that we don't really know um that's just like the reductionist view of, of it but um I think with, yeah, with like skin conditions, um, I, I think gl- glycemic load, so the amount of sugars we have has been mm-hmm. sh- shown to have the highest rate of correlation to uh, acne and then how they eat. So decreasing the glycemic load, which would be just eating less sugars, you know. So are even are, fruits or oh, uh, this would be like I'd say more processed sugars. Processed sugars. So mm-hmm. fruits are, you know, we it still has that starchy part that takes it helps it digest. There's a synergy synergism in fruit, but when we have these concentrated amounts of sugar that we consume, maybe like in a soda, then that's you know we haven't been. That's not common. Evolutionarily, that that wasn't very common, you know, mm-hmm. for that to happen. So not all sugar like levels are, are created equal. Like yeah, so the like, type like the type of food definitely matters. Mm-hmm. So like like standard American diet, you know, is like uh, high high in meats, high in fa- high in bad fats, high in carbs, um, and then but that has its own a ratio of I, I, one way to look at it is it has its own ratio. Uh, people that eat the standard American diet, you get, I think. Uh, it's a 16 to 1 ratio of omega 6 to omega 3s they get Mm -hmm. and the recommended is like ratio is 4 to 1 and so we're just putting that out of whack and then the the omega 6 portion is more inflammatory and then the omega 3s most people have heard is more anti-inflammatory so we're basically are we're making our bodies our or composing our bodies of being more Mm pro-inflammatory by just altering the composition and so uh, that diet, standard American diet, is shown to be a little bit more inflammatory. So inflammation is a key in there, mm-hmm. too, especially if, say, if, if someone's struggling with acne or something. Uh, having the, something so in your food, is, something maybe awesome in your food could be it. aggravating your system. Mm-hmm. You know, like you notice avocados are maybe aggra- changing something in your skin with your scalp, you know. Mm-hmm. And so having that awareness of what you eat is maybe affecting it could be a part of it. Uh, diversity, I think, is really important for humans to constantly be sampling different things. Just kind of, uh, 
you know, eating a stringent diet of like, you know, the same thing all the time can, can potentially lead to issues, you know, um, it just makes your body less able to potentially like, you know, handle other diverse, like other things. And also primes it to say, oh, I've been eating this so much. Maybe your, your immune system starts responding to it, you know, um, just flares it up. Yeah. Cause I brought up, uh, avocados because like I mentioned when I was, this is now nine years ago doing the, the raw vegan diet. One of the ways that I would satiate myself would be through like heavy, heavy meals. And when you're eating fruits and vegetables, uh, those are more limited. Yeah. Uh, and so avocados and nuts were, were really like big, uh, in my diet at mm-hmm. that time. And, um, avocados and nuts are the, the like two well nuts as like a food group and then also peanuts because peanut is different than a tree nut um are what i've identified as the the like causal factors of like the the symptoms that i was having Mm -hmm. and since cutting those out those have, have gone away and something else that happened too and um i've done a little bit of reading about this but uh eggs i found that eggs were were also like symptomatic in, in that same way and avocados and eggs and nuts were things that i was eating almost without fail yeah. every day for maybe the past eight years and I, is there any like experience that you've seen or maybe research that you've read where people uh, you, you know eating this, the same thing every single day yeah, that you I, can develop i can't allergies? i can't source it back to to mm-hmm. research um and i know someone who could that do it really well good job she works at this place called flora medicine her name's mm-hmm. Andrew Macbeth. But um, what I can say is like when you eat the same things, you know, if we look at um, the microbial, the microbiome, you basically you're changing the the diversity of the microbiome. You know, if you're eating the same things, something is going to like that more than others. You know, it's going to do better in those conditions. And so you're always kind of you're tweaking the balance there, I'd say. And so that's why I think having the diversity of foods is you're challenging your biome. You're also uh, giving it you're giving opportunity for other things to thrive, you know? It'd be like uh, if you, you know, if you were farming, right? And the, you knew that this, uh, this plant really liked this nutrient, and so you only gave this nutrient over and over again. Over time though, in that, in that farming situation, other things get depleted though over time and maybe that nutrient actually leads to the destruction of and you if you give it in high amounts it leads to the destruction of the organisms around it so that sometimes happens with over over fertilization Mm -hmm. you basically get a a large nutrient content but you kill a lot of other things because of it's it's almost like a toxic environment and Um, but maybe that yeah analogy yeah 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 because uh, i mean like i said I, i read it i can't cite the research study but um also from um, just personal experience and then people who I've known who have come through different diet um, scenes yeah. and experience they the same have. thing. Yeah, specifically people who are like eating too much kale, too yeah. much raw kale yeah. uh, and then building up like I think like too much of the uh, protective like nutrient that's in kale that helps to protect it from like pests or something like that. I, I'm not exactly Sure. So I won't speak to it in detail. Oh, but interesting. I'd be able to, interested in looking that. Yeah. Looking that up. Uh, in my notes here too, it's like one of the the questions that a lot of people had um, was oriented around fasting. And yeah. I, as I mentioned, I like, think it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I attended the lecture that you gave uh, just last week on fasting. Um, it could have easily been like three to <laughs> six hours, but sixty minutes was a good intro. Um, what is your take on fast or actually yeah you know what maybe let's start with like what is like fasting and the fasting that like you mm. talk about and yeah, have experience um, with so i mean like what we've been talking about is like kind of what we eat matters right mm-hmm. um and i'm not pretty i'm not like really stringent on things i like i think that people mostly should eat Mostly p- plants, you know, mm-hmm. ninety per- like if you want to put a number out there, ninety percent of your food should come from plants. From a caloric uh, or just yeah, 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 just mm-hmm. a lot of plants like that. And then, um, and then when we eat matters too. Um, and so fasting, it kind of goes into that question. And I think one the biggest I talked a little bit about this, but like one of the big things I think is in the seventies or so. So the the USDA basically put out some more, some guidelines about how we should eat, what we should eat. 
Um, in that time, they talked about having a low fat diet, a high carb, basically. And um, that actually led to a bunch of there's low fat, little, high we, carb. Yeah, we see a little uptick in um, basically cardiovascular disease. And they also like the guidelines that we're talking about when people should eat too. Mm -hmm. So breakfast, lunch, dinner. And mm -hmm. so we see adjustments in like the timing when people eat and they come down a little bit from the guidelines. But, you know, those don't necessarily always follow our cycle. Everyone's always seems like the breakfast should be their biggest meal, you know, should be the, the largest meal that carries them through the day. I think a lot, a lot of these guidelines have to do with like the expected work schedules that they want people to have and like mm -hmm. the normal working hours. Uh, but uh, if we listen to our bodies, uh, and when I listen to my body, I'm not often hungry in the morning you know i get hungry around midday even later in the day um so listening to that cue that when you you get that response but with fasting it's like the the easiest fast was basically we're always fasting sometimes when you're not away from food you're going to start entering a fasting state the farther away you're from it the the more into that fasting state you're going to be um but so you have like a fed portion which it is you know within the our uh our, our society, we, we stay in that fed portion a longer part of the day. So maybe we're, you know, from the moment we wake up, maybe it's seven to the time we go to sleep and then maybe there's more snacks. Maybe we're eating for like 14, 15, 16 hours a day when the window when we optimally eat maybe is eight hours or so um, and that we do the best physiologically is in a, a shorter window where when we eat. Um, so, and that's part of, um, I think like what you have mentioned to me that you, you do now, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, um, uh, been popular in, in like different sports and athletics yeah. is that intermittent fasting. Yeah. Intermittent fasting. So yeah. Having like an like eating window. Eating window. Yeah. yeah. They, I mean, the research, if you look at it, it's, uh, for rats, it'd be a uh, time restricted feeding. Mm -hmm. And then for humans, if you wanted to think about it, it would be time restricted eating. And so what does that look like for you or for me? Uh, yeah, my window is pretty short. I usually will, it might be an eight window, eight hour window or less. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of the, the idea is 16, eight or 18. So having or eight, maybe lunch 16, at yeah. noon and then your last meal mm -hmm. at like eight or Yeah, so you're basically away from, you're not having food in your body or not consuming food for a 16 hour window. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to, you know, go through the digestive rigmarole and then also go to that, start going to that point where using more, resources in your liver that are livers like so i talked a little bit in that fat uh, the fasting craze about how your body's uh if we look at it from a caloric or energy standpoint it's just two compartments you have uh, one compartment it's your liver the other compartments your fat so the liver holds glycogen which is like sugar chains and then uses that to basically help the brain uh have access to normal amounts of sugar and, and feed off it brain really loves it 100 percent of the time it's it's using it but then when you go into a fasting state when you're away from your your sugar basically your liver is getting rid of its stores of sugar and it gets to a point where it doesn't really have any and so then your brain is like hey sending you a signal hey replenish the liver i need food to go in there um and then the other thing that's happening too is your body is compensating for that and it's going to start breaking down fats in that period and so then it starts breaking down fats and uses, breaks those those fats and they eventually become the thing called ketones. And then the ketones can be used by your brain as if energy uh, fuel. And at so, some point uh, it could go up to 75% of the brain's fuel is fueled by ketones. So your brain has an amazing ability to use ketones and then all, your body also has an amazing ability to create sugars too. And so it's able to create sugar, a li that little bit, the nominal amount of sugar to maintain its needs and also use ketones at the same time. Um, but one of the big things I talked about in that talk was insulin response and having higher levels of insulin. So when we're like eating all the time, we're basically like having higher, we're basically creating more insulin in our body and they sh basically it's kind of kind of lead to the idea of insulin sensitivity or insensitivity mm -hmm. where basically your body starts accommodating for that amount of insulin and maybe down regulates the receptors um and so what is what does insulin do oh basically it, when we think about yeah insulin it's like uh basically it's like bringing everything into the body right mm -hmm. it's basically saying hi this is i need to store this stuff it's like gonna say i'm eat i'm eating 
I'm gonna have this hormone, and it's gonna. This hormone basically it sends a signal to, throughout the body. Insulin is saying, a hormone. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, si signaling, uh, sending a signaling a signal throughout the body saying, "Hey, hey, there's all this food here, man. Uh, you need to, you want to store this?" And I was like, "Okay, yeah, let's store it." So there's kind of this talking that happens between the hormone and the cells that are around it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so. That can, but the issue with insulin and having basically insulin uh, resistance or resistance to the response of insulin and how maybe higher chronically high levels or so is, uh, or having kind of di dysregulation in that signaling, uh, it leads to a lot of, it's implicating a lot of disease pathways. And so the, so. the um, response of insulin will kind of like fall out of balance if you, or if someone is constantly like feeding themselves, is that? Uh, I, I, I think the, just having that, I think physiologically we're not, we're not geared, we're not primed to be eating all the time. You know, that's mm -hmm. just like food has been, you know, scarce, it's hard to get by. You had to like go forage around for it or you didn't have access to it all the time. And going but by now we're, now we're kind of like always snacking, always eating a lot of like, you know, on a societal level, cultural level, we're kind of always doing those things. We have to always be fed. Um, but I think it's better to to have kind of that variability in your response, you know, like having a period where you eat, you get that spike and then you get that response versus you eat and then you keep on eating and you keep on eating. And you just kind of have this bit, this rising baseline of insulin just kind of going throughout your body throughout the day. So that's one portion of the kind of that in, insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. that responds to it. Uh, there's some other information coming out about maybe it's about how the fat, the fat composition that we eat too is affecting it. Mm -hmm. Um and it can be implicated into the the signaling process. So if we think of like cell signaling, basically uh, you have the cell membrane, um, and then on that membrane, it's gonna you have all these receptors, and then those receptors signal transduce a signal throughout the membrane, and then down into the contents of the cell to to activate some pathway. Um, so most things interact with cell mem like the cell membrane and the receptor. And the other things can bypass that, right? They're like the fat soluble thing, the, the steroids, you know, that go mm -hmm. through and they can directly affect the the ability of that cell. So um, as far as like molecular machinery, that's kind of what's going on generally mm -hmm. with those things. And sometimes with like, say if we eat, if we're eating in that window all the time, we're like always sending sending a signal to this area, right? And your body's like, well, I don't know. If I, I don't really need this much of a signal to have the, this response. So then it starts down-regulating the receptors. Mm -hmm. So this so has less of those insulin receptors. And so it's like, okay, I can get the same response with less. And so then the pathway is kind of starting to shift a little bit. You're going more insens insensitive to it in that, in that period because you're basically, you need higher levels of insulin to get the same response. Mm -hmm. So your body is going through this process of like, you know, adapting to these continual responses of insulin. What do you think is the, the easiest way for someone to approach like modifying their lifestyle or how they eat if they identify as like someone who's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I do eat from the moment I wake up till the moment I sleep. Mm -hmm. Like how, how would someone like what would be the first steps that they should take towards like changing that if they wanted to yeah. uh almost like retrain their like insulin sensitivity yeah. I, I i think that yeah i mean for me the target is like thinking of insulin for a, mm -hmm. a person in general it would probably be you know just examining how you feel and being in touch with what you need in the moment mm -hmm. um i think you should try it for a while where you do that time restricted eating uh, where you what would be like a, a place to start for some people? Yeah, I would say just don't eat breakfast. Most people skip breakfast. Yeah. See, I do prolong the fast mm -hmm. um, and see how long how long you can do that. Or maybe you eat breakfast and dinner. I mean, breakfast and uh, lunch and don't eat the rest of the day. Or what something. are common but, um, um, kind of like f expressions of someone's insulin uh, receptors being out of whack? Like, is it like energy levels? Is it weight issues? Is it Oh, so, else? I mean, like, one thing we think of uh, with, like, type 2 diabetes is mm -hmm. we, like, that. that's kind of the disease process that we'd want to, mm -hmm. that'd be the, the far edge of it, um, where someone's starting entering a disease process, and so then you have disease, potentially disease progression, where they can mm -hmm. get worse if they continue, continue doing the things that they have. 
Um, so your question was about how does, um, what are some something, what are some things people could see if yeah, maybe they're at Yeah, because it's like if, if somebody's uh, in, insulin uh, maybe started to come to a place of like better functioning, like how would they know that? Oh, how would yeah. they know that? Yeah, like, what would they feel that's different? Okay, I think, that, I mean, outside of just looking at, like, oh, yeah, thinking of, oh, my insulin's doing better. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I mean, for me, that'd be something I would would want, want to monitor and not necessarily is correlated, but they, the general thing is that they should have higher energy. They should have a better thinking a little bit, and um, they should just feel, like, feel better in general, mm -hmm. you know, high, like they're not as fatigued and such like that. So you wouldn't be experiencing maybe like crashes in energy as much as uh, more balanced throughout crashes, the day? Crashes in energy might have to deal, do more with uh, the composition of what someone's eating. So if someone's having like just living off sugar, you know, mm -hmm. like so there's people that drink a soda throughout the whole day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're just doing... Or have a donut. Is or have a donut, thing. yeah. Um, I was so, at a hospital yesterday and the person who was our... Um, our guide at the hospital who works at the hospital that's exactly what they were eating they just say yeah, it didn't right. look good yeah it didn't look good and he didn't yeah he didn't seem like he was doing she well. yeah she didn't fortunately yeah um but yeah i mean uh i think the biggest thing for someone to implement and the why why would someone want to implement this is yeah exactly thing? i think we kind of yeah, like why would somebody really want to do an like, fast for like outside of me thinking of insulin and stuff um I think um, what, the benefits of it is that with the time restricted eating, is you get you know you basically are maybe are reducing your risk of these diseases, but you're also going into a point of fat burning a little bit more. So a, a lot of uh, I mean, there's a lot of like obesity has been shown to be correlated to a lot of diseases, and it's just something that people uh, struggle with sometimes. Um, but it's also the the approach I wouldn't want to go with is weight loss, but like basically. Because the weight loss, like if someone is looking to just lose weight, it's been shown to basically have more, be de more detrimental, you know. The the uh, the bigger thing should be a, a self-care and self-nurturance. Mm -hmm. And I see fasting as a point of self-care and self-nurturance. It brings you back in touch with your body's normal physiological responses. And I think that's one of the biggest things I would be wanting to help someone is to be able to examine when they actually do need to eat and to, f to also feel, you know, that variability in what it's not like to eat and to manage that. You know, uh, I used to get hangry, you know when I, I when I started this, I used to get irritable, like as if I needed food all the time. But eventually your body adapts and you don't experience that way that anymore. And the other thing that you start to experience is more clarity. Like more more more, more coherence, you know. Mm -hmm. So that mental aspects of Clear health. thought. Yeah. Um, and that's probably a response to the higher levels of like adrenaline that pumps through in that time. And then um, the other thing is like, you know, we don't we don't need to be eating all the time and we don't need to store all this this energy all the time because we have plenty of access but um going in going into that ketosis that part where you're eating more you're using more ketones for body means that you know you're gonna be burning more fat you know um and what's your body fat percentage as last check oh my gosh uh yeah that was ridiculous <laughs> what do you so say you had a dexa scan a little while ago yeah no is it when i was 21 yeah i participated in the I was a participant in a study and they were basically measuring a bioelectrical impedance assay. Mm -hmm. So it's that thing that runs, it sends a current through your body and it registers it on the other s s side. So it could be from your hand to hand, it could be your hand to your feet. Um, but basically it shows how resistant is that current to going through your body. And so it gets a readout. They put in X amount of current and they only get back a, a fraction of X. It gives you an indication of potentially the the insulation that you have, so of a uh, of fat, um, and so they kind of they kind of can extrapolate that data to look at uh, uh, to a standardized equation based off a gold standard of human body composition, which would be is is the DEXA scan right now, and it's a basically an X-ray scan, and they look at your they can look at, at your lean your mass in different compartments of like fat, water, weight, etc. And so then they can give you a percentage, but mine was uh, like at that time six percent, so pretty low. <laughs> what would you estimate it's at now? Yeah, and I was I, I wasn't actually a I've always been I always skip breakfast a lot of mm -hmm. part and maybe that's to deal with it, but I think part of it the other part is like my family is just skinny, you know, mm -hmm. We're like well that's kind of like who we are. I don't think it's possible for me to gain weight. So there's a, another like gain weight easily into a, a large amount. 
Um, so I think there's that's another thing you know that gets overlooked. There's some people that are more susceptible to wise, yeah, yeah to gaining weight, and uh, it's likely a more of an adaptive response maybe from uh, struggling with food in the past or food insecurity maybe a generation ago even mm -hmm. you know or um, over evolutionary like even longer lineages where people had to struggle in that way. But um, and so our bodies like over time you know adapt across generations too so and the during the windows when you're not eating like it's you're not eating food but maybe like you're drinking water drinking tea oh yeah drinking drink coffee yeah and, i can you can drink yeah. plenty of uh plenty of coffee you know yeah. uh you can drink uh water and, and uh yeah i'm, I'm staying hydrated mm -hmm. and in fact I, I could use a glass of water right now just because yeah we, i was talking let's but, get it i'll go get you water are you sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. just hang tight i'll oh, just yeah. go get it if you want to just riff, uh, you know, maybe a, a nice story about whatever. <laughs> Be right back. Just water? I'll just doodle here for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> maybe let people know um, the next uh, like lecture series. That's oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so at, at the circuit, um, we're doing these lecture series, and it's part of this organization I'm part of called Whole Systems Healthcare. And basically with Whole Systems Healthcare, it's a nonprofit organization. And they have three initiatives, uh, education initiative, a research initiative, and then a clinical initiative. So I'm on that clinical portion or providing clinical care. A lot of things I do are related to uh, kind of the, the fasting is one thing I implement and fasting ex specifically in treating type two, di type two diabetes. Um, but uh, yeah, the next lecture series is going to be held, let's see, it's on the 3rd Thursday of the month. So, July someday. I'd have to look in the calendar. Awesome. But um, third Thursday, it'll be posted. I want to address like, a question that we got from somebody asking. It's related to fasting as well. Um, and I don't know if you'd be able to answer this one, but somebody was wondering, is a 24-hour fast enough time to reset gut biome? And what would any sort of advantages to a 24-hour fast be? Or a, uh, like a two questions, actually. Yeah, so we'll go with that benefits. Yeah, and um, if maybe you could just move it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that, oh, there it is. So the 24-hour fast, um, so you, you're basically entering that point where you're, and, and there's two compartments. Water fast. Yeah, water only fasting. Four hour water fast. You're basically yeah. entering that point of where you've depleted all your glycogen. And so, from an energy standpoint, you're starting to go a lot more into ketosis. This is actually the point where they say you go fully, more, more fully into ketosis. Um, so, basically, you see a drop in the glycogen and then a rise in your ability to make sugar and then, then a rise in your ability to make. To, to use your fat storage as as energy. Um, so that's kind of what's going on on that biochemical level. But then the the benefits of it for the gut health and yeah. resetting. Yeah, I would. So if you do have like, why would you be doing it is the biggest thing is like, are, are you, is it for a kind of normal maintenance? Is it, I, I'd be questioning what's the purpose of it in a mm -hmm. way. Um, I think it's just good in general to kind of challenge yourself with a fast and have that variability. But if it's and 24 for, hours is a pretty safe. Yeah. But it sounds like this is targeted specifically to like some process that's going on. So I'd be curious about what mm -hmm. that process is. And, um, but, um, yeah, if it's person, like resetting the gut microbiome, is that mm -hmm. what they said? Uh, just oh, gut biome. I know this biome? person okay. in particular, uh, did just come back from a three month stay in, uh, in Thailand. I don't oh, know okay. if yeah. they, are experiencing yeah. any sort of <laughs> travel bug or uh, anything yeah like yeah that. <laughs> uh yeah there you got a new visitor um yeah. in there it's it's trying to make a home um <laughs> no, it's like a, i know i think it's an invasive right. species yeah. you know you think of like uh it's like the yeah and actually another question that was related to that was uh is uh, an extended fast of like two to three days enough to fix gut flora and i i don't think that that's like a, a simple question yeah, those are pretty those are pretty related mm -hmm. uh too that so um i actually did uh spend a lot of time with kind of like the gastro side of naturopathic medicine and one of the treatments one of the big things that were com was coming up a lot in the last few years is small SIBO SIBO small intestinal bacteria overgrowth so these are kind of like maybe uh irritable bowel syndrome you know like 
kind of bowels, maybe constipation, so diarrhea, but right, also maybe right a lot of flatulent, mm -hmm. or a lot of farting, a lot of burping and stuff like that. Uh, fatigue and feeling like it is related to your gastrointestinal system, pretty common. But um, yeah, so some of the treatments were targeted at destroying the, the bacteria there, right? And the overgrowth of it. And so, and then, then replenishing the population. So it's kind of like, a, you know, it, taking down a home and then building a new one up, trying to build a new one up from uh, different parts, you know, scraps. But um, so one thing I, I, with a 24 hour fast is uh, I don't think you're gonna really set your biome that much. Uh, when you challenge bacteria to, and you don't give them any food, which is kind of what's gonna happen a little bit is, uh, and the other thing is depending on where they're situated to, cause they actually reside in a kind of, normally in a mucilaginous area, layer um, and you're along your intestines. So maybe we should go back to how your body functions a little bit before we describe that. But so you have your, your intest your digestive system and it's actually, when you eat something, it's not in your body yet. You have to absorb it to be in your body. So they call that area the lumen, the area in between. Um, and basically that, that lumen, when if it's some, there's food in there, it's not actually in your body yet. So you have to absorb it. And the, the one thing is like, it's on your outside of your body, like your skin here, is you have these protective factors that limit the things that come in contact with the skin. And so you have basically a mucus layer that surrounds your digestive tract. And you sure you've seen the mucus come out. If you get sick, you know, you, you cough up some stuff. That's kind of, that's part of that music mucilaginous. So it's kind of thick and it protects you. It's like the first layer defense from an outsider. And so for bacteria, they usually can't penetrate that area. They kind of stay there and they can actually, they, that's, some some normal bacteria that's kind of their home you know they they the commensals they say um that's where they live they, that's kind of where they thrive but your body has this natural reflex of just moving things over you know it's like hey let's evacuate let's keep on things moving so you don't get too stuck you don't have a huge growth so that's how your body modulates it and one of the big things it does by that is when you're fasting actually you're two hours later post meal that's when your body starts having those regular reflexes of moving things out of your body but so if you're constantly eating you're constantly filling up your stomach you don't get that response and that's called you can look it up it's called the migrating motor complex and it's the basically what happens when your body the body is not doesn't have food in it and it is a, a peristaltic wave it's like a wave that goes throughout your body a wave that goes through int your intestines to flush things out to keep things moving um so with a 24-hour fast back to that question you you actually like that the, the the study on longevity and fasting so a lot of that research actually came from uh, looking at yeast and bacteria and seeing mm -hmm. if they put them in a nutrient-rich medium and then put them in the nutrient-deprived medium uh, how long do they live? And so like yeast bacteria, a lot of different species show that they live longer when uh, they are fasting or have been fasted in a period in their life. So uh, I don't know if a 24 hour fast would do it for maybe that question. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, I have a bug. Reset I have a bio. bug, you know, maybe, and I yeah. need to reset it. And it, uh, um, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that would work for that purpose. Um, but with the, the small intestinal bacteria overgrowth thing, that one of the treatments that I was told about at the time was a, a two-week water-only fast, and that would take that same approach of maybe taking like a, uh, to diminish the population, basically, mm -hmm. and bring it back to maybe more of a baseline. And that's under uh, guided kind of like supervision? Yeah, I think anytime you're engaging in a fast that long, you want it to be guided to be supervised, especially if you have a health condition um, uh, the other things you want to have cautions with just fasting for a long period of time is to look at your body weight. And there are also some disease conditions that you'd, you'd be like contraindicated. So if someone's malnourished, you know, if someone has anorexia would be one. If someone's, uh, has cancer, there's cachexia that ha happens with cancer where it's like wasting. So the, it's a nutritional deficiency. Alcoholism leads to nutritional deficiencies, uh, different if you, there's a general nutritional defi deficiency, you wouldn't want to do it. Um, but uh, then you had that question about a 
two to three. Oh, somebody okay. was asking about uh, 48 to 72 hours. Is that enough to fix gut flora and will it get me into ketosis? Um, oh yeah, yeah, 48 to 72 will definitely get you into ketosis. Um, so that's two to three days. Um, mm-hmm. The point at which you enter is gut flora. Is that what they Well, I, I think gut. they had a similar question as like they're made. I don't. I, I shouldn't assume that they're experiencing any sort of issues with their with their digestion, yeah. but they were asking if it's enough time to fix gut flora. So it's yeah, the probably fix no. fix means problem. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some problem going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there there's that. Wait, what's that disclaimer again? Um, let's see. What was it? Uh, let's read it. Always consult a physician before beginning any treatment. Um, <laughs> but uh, w- with that, though, um, I think you're, you're getting to that point where you are going to change the population in mm-hmm. your bi- microbiome. Um, I, I think some, of the, some more of the research is coming out, too, that it is um, going to affect probably gut cell life. And I think one, one of the – I actually was reading a paper on uh, Drosophila, that fl- the fly, and they're showing they did a two days of feeding and five days of fasting, and uh, they saw some changes in the gut health of that. Of that it's pretty powerful species. In, in, in fasting. So like a, that's like you know <laughs> that's an insect. Uh, we're a human. Uh, you can't extrapolate that data yeah. really. But it's interesting, and it also gives further research to do maybe on other species and see what happens. I think uh, the the research though is is not really out yet on on all the a lot of these things mm-hmm. um so everyone's kind of using fasting as kind of a catch-all for a lot of things i think it is juice fasting very is different freaking fasting. promising though i yeah. do think it's very promising i think if you have a, a disease th- that you're working through you should always do use it with ca- caution and consult a medical provider um but so a lot of these questions have to do with like uh i don't want to tell you something that i don't know anything about but mm-hmm. i i mean you Basically, you are going to change the population. That's what's going to happen. If you don't have resources to eat something, you, things start dying off, you know, things start going away. Um, so, yeah, that'd be my, my big take on it. Um, there's the uh, other part, too, of the, the research with this is looking at autophagy. And we, we talked about, mm-hmm. you mentioned it actually at the, did, the lecture. Yeah. You actually brought it up. Yeah. I was like, oh, cool. Uh, autophagy also, as people hear that, autophagy is probably the cooler way to say it. And actually, I'll, I'm going to start saying autophagy. Um, <laughs> but, um, and so what is that for folks unfamiliar with Yeah, it's basically like your your cell, is cell's ability to uh, recycle its organelles so mm-hmm. it's little organs and its body and its own cell body and to replenish them and a lot of it has to do with recycling your big the big factory of energy in the cell called the mitochondria and so uh it helps basically make that cell more effective in doing what it's going to do um potentially it can also resolve defunctive cells so like they've actually there's been research showing that um and so uh, fasting helps to promote yeah those processes yeah those processes um so senescence old cells you know we, th- we think of old age these days and it's like oh you're kind of slower you're not doing things as well you're not moving as well that doesn't have to necessarily be old age but that's kind of like the stigma of old age a little bit of ageism um so similarly if we take that kind of that's <laughs> that stereotype and think of the cells that kind of they, they're, they're not functioning as high as a level they possibly could um and it maybe has to do with what we see in old age le- much later so but you can improve the functioning of that cell and so some of the research is promising um is very promising in showing that it might actually uh, help the body get rid of certain things that aren't helpful in it like in alzheimer's there's this thing called amyloid pl- plaques that build up one of the big things with alzheimer's is like people one of the big correlations is they show that people have disrupted sleep patterns and during the night your brain is kind of acting like a sponge there's this there's a study on these rats and basically they were looking at the amyloid plaques and were kind of disrupting sleep and then also had uh, rats that slept well so basically they are showing that the sleep patterns affected the amount of amyloid plaque that was resided in the the neurons and so your body is able to fl- get rid of that plaque through sleep but also um p- the another mechanism of getting rid of kind of those things that are in your cells is autophagy and your, b- your body is able to basically recycle those things so that's why perhaps we see things uh, we see this 
the same mechanism in exercise. Uh, it's called exercise-induced autophagy. And we see very similar things where our body adapts to these things. This is how our body is responding physiologically. This is how our cells in particular are responding. And they are able to basically improve the functioning of things. So that's why you maybe have improved cognitive formants. You have better people like think, thinking ability with people that exercise more. Um, so you see those kind of health benefits get translated on a cellular level. And that's the explanation for it. That's part of the explanation for it. Um, lots of benefits. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, lots of research. So, I mean, like that. a lot of the research is always looking for the molecular mechanism and understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And that's all, it's really helpful, you know. Um, but also, it oftentimes, like, kind of preaches to like an idea, like things that we know we should already do, but we just need research to tell us that we should do them, you know. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, <laughs> I, need, I need this to tell me why I should do something. It's yeah. like, uh, there's also that feeling aspect of it. It's like, oh, you know is there something wrong in my life? Like we're a little out of touch of the feelings, you know, I think, or our, our experience of life and we get caught up in the stresses of it too. So it's help, hard to analyze it. But um, I think if you, you, you really came back into to touch with the, the body and listening to what it's saying, it'd probably tell you, hey, uh, this, see this, uh, this, this was a little flame here, but now it, when a disease process happens, it's like, oh, uh, you have a fire here in your body and you need to, we need to stamp it out kind of thing. So uh, w these me messages we get are a lot of like the mm -hmm. smoke signals, you know, the smoke and the, uh, if we can smell the smoke and listen to it, then oftentimes we can do things ahead of time to help potentially avoid it. Um, health promotion though is not always like, it's not the end all, you know, mm -hmm. uh, some things just happen. So um, I think I was reading this recent study is like health promotion uh, even if you're doing all these health promotion things, it only accounts for maybe 25% of the risk of involved in uh, uh, decreasing, you know, disease progression. Um, so it's not the whole thing, you know, there's all yeah. these other things. And that was from um, a Linda Bacon health at every size thing as specifically talking about health promotion for uh, obesity and kind of the, the, lo the lo loss of weight surrounding that that happens. So I'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Um, Lee, lots of really good practical um, perspective and advice. I um, really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdoms. Oh, yeah. Um, for anybody who wants to learn more or is maybe curious in actually, like, um, you know, finding out if there's a way that you could help them, uh, what's the best way to, to maybe, like, follow you across the Internet and social, but also to get in touch with you if anybody does have any uh, concerns they'd work? You know, oh yeah. Talk um, about. Well, thanks for asking me, me about that. Um, thanks for having me here too. This is wonderful. Uh, talk to <laughs> we talk a lot about. Uh, I think I always start with a little bit of philosophy because that's kind of where I go. There's and a lot then, of good uh, nuggets. Yeah, and then. Uh, uh, but yeah, you could reach me at um, my website, Medicinal Narrative. So. Uh, dot com. Dot com. Yeah, Medicinal Narrative. Dot com, and then I have like a link to about who I am as a practitioner, what I do. Some of the big things I, I, I I'm I'm aiming to treat are type fasting with type two di diabetes. So taking a nutritional and a fasting approach to treating type two diabetes, um, and then also climber performance is another big one I'm working on. But I also provide like kind of holistic primary care. So if you are looking for just a practitioner to help you like work on all any health promotion things you want in your life but also a practitioner that is able to diagnose a di potential disease condition that you are concerned that you might have um, that's kind of where I'm at so those three areas are the, my focus and you can find information on my website about that medicinalnarrative.com and then uh, I also work I'm contracted at a clinic called Whole Systems Healthcare super awesome nonprofit clinic and that's where I do my practice and at. That's in Portland, Oregon as yeah, well? Yeah, Portland, Oregon. It's in the downtown area, uh, 1020 Southwest Taylor Street or so. It's actually pretty close to a cool organization called Outside In. I don't know. If oh, you, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, I think I've done a video project for them a while um, back. And then the med it's in the medical arts building. So you see uh, some uh, imagery of Hippocrates on the, the facade of the building and stuff. Beautiful. So, yeah. Awesome. Dr. Lee Po, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and uh, looking forward to catching you at the circuit another time soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks Very again, man. Thanks for tuning in. Over and out.